Uh, but I think I, I think of you talk about a standing committee member going to jail and Xi Jinping sort of and he talks about Xi Jinping accru uh, Bill talked about Xi Jinping accruing um, so much power, taking power over the, uh, over the security or taking control of the security services uh, over the military. I see those as connected to uh, where we had a decade of collective leadership that seems to have gone, at least from Xi Jinping's perspective, and I think from some other elites' perspective, awry under Hu Jintao uh, and Wen Jiabao. You know, it's referred to within the party uh, by some as the lost decade, uh, and I feel like the ability of Zhou Yangkong to amass so much power um, was a result of being able to exploit uh, the collective leadership model. And Xi Jinping, uh, I think, saw that and has decided uh, to uh, essentially uh, reassert power. I, I don't think he's changing all of the rules, um, but I think you know he's rejected the collective leadership model that existed uh, previously, but I don't think he's rewritten all of the rules. So, I mean, it's so tell, tell me then, I mean, how many of you think the kind of party strengthening, party rectification, whatever you want to call it that's going on now, is actually reversing prior policies or changing things in a way that was not the case, say, 10 years ago. So I'll give you an example. You know, when, when Jiang was general secretary of the party, you have this three represents, then the idea was to bring the, the business establishment into the party. But when I look at what's going on now, I see people at the center of the party, starting with, with Xi, who say, actually, the, the party is the establishment. And so rather than bringing some ex external establishment into the party, we're going to, first of all, inject the establishment into other elements of the society. You mean so ex inject the party into other Exactly. Elements of the so well, first, you, you, you rectify it's a one party state. Therefore, if you're going to be a one party state, we need to have a clean party, a self regulating party, a well managed party. Thus, we need to deal with corruption. We need to rectify. But what's more, uh, we need to alter the connections between business and politics in the first instance, but also the way the party relates to social organizations, private business, and others. So it's essentially standing some of what we saw previously on its head. I, well, I think because it's a different way of thinking about what's establishment. Well, part of it, I think, is you have the lessons that they've taken lots of lessons from the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and clearly, one of the lessons was that um, you know, the party had become dissolute and flaccid and had sort of slacked off and had lost control of, of society and the economy. And so um, clearly, she is putting the party back in command. I mean, well, there's the quote from one of his, the book that came out recently in his speeches, where what's his quote about how, you know, it was an east, west, north, south, the party leads everything, right? And, and that's sort of a politics and command kind of approach that um, we haven't seen in a, in a very long time in China. And I think it's a reaction in part to um, also the Jasmine Revolution, which is sort of five years ago, this period where. I think they looked at, because a lot of this stuff actually predates Xi, though. There was a lot of this sort of party strengthening that was beginning in the Hu administration. Xi actually, as, as in his role in the party, he was in charge of party construction. So this is also not a new thing for him. But I think a lot of it was also looking in 2011 at what was going on with democracy promotion in the Middle East. But as you, as you said, we saw all of this post-color post, post revolutions. You know, so 2004, or five. Hu Jintao was using much of the same language. It's just become, I think, well, But Xi Hu Jintao was not nearly as effective. I mean, she brings not, a sort exactly. of a, a much more vitality effective. Yeah. and a sort of a, a, a strength. And, a, and, a, and really, I think he's injected a ton of fear into mm -hmm. the system. And ultimately, he, you know, this only works with fear. And because they were under the Hu administration, nobody was afraid of anybody. Yeah, I also think, I mean, we talk a lot about the way that Xi Jinping regards the fall of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev. I think we should talk a lot about how he regards the previous 10 years. You know, Gotti described it as, and I agree, people talk about it as a lost decade. But when you dig into that, the sort of detail of the relationship between Xi Jinping and his cohort, and, you know, some of us can get really into um, understanding the difference between being born into the party, being of the revolutionary families and being not of the revolutionary families, that distinction often gets lost from far away. When you're looking at it from the US, you say, well, they're, you know, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, what's the difference? Xi Jinping, they, they seem like they come out of the same pedigree. No, it's a, it's a profound difference. I mean, if you are Xi Jinping and you are a son of the revolution, you tend to look at the apparatchiks, and that's the way they would look at it. The guys, the hired hands is the term that's used in Chinese for the, for the uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, 
crowd and they say, we lost our way. We, the party, lost our way. And so, you know, in some sense, yes, yeah, some of it was going on under Hu Jintao, but I think there is a real feeling that Jiang Zemin in opening up to the business community and expanding the definition of the party to encompass all these other elements, that there was a sloppiness that got in. And that's, I mean, you know, that's the underlying motive behind so much of what we've seen over the last couple of years is to try to bring the party back into its proper form. It, it, and one Discipline. thing, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I think you guys will probably agree, is 2011, 2012, you know, be it Lamborghinis and other things at your doorsteps, whatever was going on, it really, I, it really felt like China was actually, it would sort of this, it could sort of fly apart because mm -hmm. the corruption was so egregious, so yeah. ostentatious, so out of control that it, it, it was a, really quite, I mean, the economy was booming, people were making lots of money, but it was a really deeply unhealthy place. And, and Politically and socially. At the same time, you had social media becoming mm -hmm. a real force to be reckoned with. I mean, which, you know, the, I, you've, I think you first saw a reaction against it, the strong reaction in 2009 after the, you know, events in Iran, the so called Facebook revolution, and then you had the ethnic riots in Xinjiang, and they shut down the internet for half a year and the entire uh, Xinjiang autonomous region, uh, as it's known. Um, and the Wenzhou train crash in 2011, I mean, for me, that's kind of the watershed event in terms of internet policy, mm -hmm. uh, because the party completely lost control of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole weekend when millions, you know, hundreds of millions of people were basically cussing out the government. <clears throat> And they clamped down after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, I, and, I, and it was before Xi Jinping came along that mm -hmm. all of this tightening began with the internet. I think she does bring a vitality to all of, to, to the party building, to discipline. Um, but I think a lot of that was in place before. And I, I would point to the secu what happens with, what's happened with security services. Because there is a narrative out there that from, that up until about the Olympics, uh, things were sort of loosening up in China. And I, I, I reject that. I, I think the high watermark for civil society in China uh, and openness or allowing um, kind of which when uh, rights defense lawyers to, to operate was 2003. Um, and specifically the, um, this case of Sun Zhigang, a migrant worker who was beaten to death in Guangzhou. Um, and this became a moment of some triumph for, uh, for the rights, rights defense movement uh, when they were able to get uh, a law, you know, repealed and um, cha changed the way migrant workers are, are uh, changed and changed the way migrant workers are treated. Uh, since then, uh, those lawyers have progressively been um, uh, hounded, jailed, disappeared uh, more and more every year. Uh, and this was happening long before Xi Jinping came onto the scene. And it was under Lu Gan who was talking about. Um, you know, the, he was talking about hostile foreign forces and the influence of, um, of NGOs, uh, and he was talking about the kind of evils of the rights defense movement as early as 2004 and 5. Um, and then Zhou Yang Kang, uh, who, who was public security chief from 2002 to 2007 and now was running the whole show, I think only consolidated power more uh, in part by increasing the uh, repressive capacities of the security apparatus. So that is something that I think Xi Jinping has only actually continued. He just has taken it under his own, can, under can, his own wing. 